you know, everyone, can you give me welcome to the to the Garden Museum? I'm very happy to see you all um, here. Uh, I'm Judith Lösing. I'm an architect, uh, director at EATS, and also a research fellow with the Architecture Foundation. And this event is sort of part of a series of talks that I've put up as part of a research around the social and cultural um, role of trees in London. Um, the first one was about local care and production. We had sort of activists, foresters, foragers, architects and makers there talking about um, sort of local, uh, local interventions. The second one was more about the planning system and looking at money and trees and how they relate in terms of growth and degrowth. And you can see both of those, um, both of those events uh, back on YouTube on the Architecture Foundation's channel. And um, why I was sort of, well, as, as I was starting the research and sort of preparing the talks, I got contacted by so many people who were upset about um, losing local trees and wanting to protest or wanting to get um, sort of advice and how they can be, what, how they can deal with sort of um, green space or, or trees being lost. And I, I felt, I, I don't know, I'm not the tree police. That was sort of really what I was <laughs> expecting. But I thought there is something in this idea of protest and it would be interesting to put up an event that thinks about um, protest in a, in a slightly different way. And um, what occurred to me is that it's sort of uh, maybe easier to protest against something, but quite hard to dream of the future and uh, think what we what we what we're actually living towards what what kind of how we how we want to live together so but the way we want to think today about protest is is to explore if dreaming with like jenny said already can be can be a way of um of activism and reflection and um so the first uh, the, the the there was for example in in the architecture foundation i think in 2000 there was a competition around Car Free London, I think Musk at the time said, it's quite easy um, to get rid of the car. What's hard is really to imagine what we would use or in the space that we would gain for. So that, that's what tonight is um, about to some extent. The first piece that you heard was um, a sonic meditation, was sort of based on a sonic meditation by Pauline Oliveros. She's, she wrote this um, meditation in around 1970 and her uh, <coughs> instructions for them were um, search for a natural or artificial canyon forest or deserted municipal squat. And I like that there's this equivalence between a forest and an urban space as a place to gather and be together. And she was also exploring this listening as a form of activism, so not escape, but, um, but a pause for thoughtful action. And that's maybe really what we need um, at this moment also with what's going on wider in the world. So the film that we saw by Andrew and also showed the, this practice of being together in the choir during uh, COVID when we couldn't, um, when the choir couldn't meet other than in outside spaces. And the, and the sort of these spaces were really giving us a, giving, giving us in the choir space to gather. And the songs that, um, that the choir is singing becomes sometimes like, like mantras, like these words that you see on the, on the banners up here. They are um, sort of intended to guide guide you through difficult situations or difficult places in the city. So they're sort of things that you can repeat to yourself. And Imogen later will talk about how fear changes, particularly the way girls move about um, in the city. So that's something we want to explore as well. Um, so the three speakers that I've invited tonight, they will talk about trespassing or claiming space in, in different ways. And what they share is that they all have an observation um, uh, that, they, that, they, that they took and uh, made some action or made some proposals that came about this observation of some uh, unequal access to trees or green space. Um, Lord, Alberto Lawrence unfortunately had a bereavement and can't join us today, but um, we'll be showing some um, slides of work that her practice edited for, um, for maps for part W, uh, maps for London, and, and I could talk about them a little bit later. So first we'll hear from um, Sydney Bauman, she's a French landscape architect. Um, she's working between landscape, architecture, urbanism, and exhibition design. And she worked at Tobotech, Inside Outside, the Picture Blaise, um, Atelier de Walter, and Fontana Landschaftsarchitektur. And she established her own office in 2021. She's a guest lecturer at the ETH in Zurich. And I became interested in her work through um, the Camden Art Center. And it was something called Botanical Mind, where she was talking about her research on the behavior of plants. and. Um, she's sort of from that investigating 
uh, the relationship between queer, uh, queer theory and ecological thought and celebrates the sort of multitudes of shapes, gender, sexes, and color that exist around us. So, yeah, Celine, if you're here, join us. Good evening, everybody here. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I would like to thank the Architecture Foundation and Judith Closing to allow me to, to be here tonight with you. And I would like to talk with you about um, yeah, a project uh, which, uh, start, <laughs> which started as a self-initiative project and has uh, evolved around time. And um, yeah, I would like to, to start with this picture because Somehow there's many ways we can look at nature and the ecological and um, biodiversity ecosystem aspects of it are crucial. But also somehow, I'm also quite interested in the cultural relation we have with nature. And I find always this picture very uh, telling somehow. It's a um, poster that was made. Okay. It's a poster that was uh, made during the um, Occupy uh, movement in London um, in that St. Paul's Cathedral in 2011 at the follow-up of the financial crisis from 2008-9. And yeah, I just find it very telling because if you look at the brands on the left, I think it's quite easy. Everybody can recognize them. But when, it's, when we start to look at the plants, it's, uh, it's more difficult. And, I find it um, quite representative from the friction we have today. So we are part of nature, but still we, we are like so far away from it from time to time. And this friction uh, somehow interests me. So the Queen Nature Project is a project that started, um, somehow I got uh, interested to know about the sexuality of plants. As a landscape architect, it's something, so I knew a bit about it, but not so much, because as a landscape architect, I was more looking at plants through their aesthetic qualities, if they're like big, tall, um, which colors they have. And uh, when I moved to Basel in Switzerland, when I'm based now in 2017, I started to wander through the parks and to try to discover about this topic. So I had a chance to uh, present this work in very beautiful settings, like here today, or like this uh, collaboration with the Theatre Festival in Basel. And somehow it always starts it by, um, for me it started also by really being by making herbariums, because I started to Google a bit uh, sexuality in plants, and um, I would get information maybe but about um, exotic plants. And I was quite interested to know really about uh, what is happening in the natural world around me. So this um, herbarium was part of the research process. By doing these herbariums also, I uh, inscribed myself in this tradition of uh, young ladies botanizing, which was always seen as being like a very uh, app appropriate uh, activities for, for women. So I would like to present you some of those uh, findings tonight, because actually the, the more I researched into it and the more it was uh, exciting. So I hope I can, uh, I can share this, um, and, yeah, this excitement with you. So um, somehow what I, what I realized first, so there's different ways uh, plants have uh, their sexual uh, characteristic, and uh, I will uh, review uh, some of them. So actually there's some plants which are like uh, a bit like us, the humans, that it, they can only be male or only be female. This is something which is called in botanical terms uh, DO issues. <coughs> and uh, I will show you an example of that. For instance, um, a plant, uh, I guess you all know, which is the yew. It's a hedge which is used, used to make a uh, yeah, very dense hedge. It's an evergreen grows well, so you see it a lot around uh, gardens. And if you look at the, at the use and at the leaves, you cannot really recognize um, if they're male or female. I mean, they both have like um, very shiny leaves, very narrow, so it's not, this is not a feature. But in the spring, if you start to uh, look at the flowers, then it starts to become interesting because some of the plants, the male ones, they have more like, um, they have like staminate flowers, means they have like male flowers having uh, carrying pollen. 
While some other shrubs will then have a pistillate flower, so which is like a female flower scaring ovaries. And then when pollination occurs through wind or insects, um, the female flower gets pollinated. And then while the male flower just desiccate and die, the female flower um, produce like a shiny red berry, which is actually called uh, aril in botanical term. But so, which is really nice with that, is that actually the female yew tree is uh, favored by the gardener because it carries these uh, beautiful, shiny berries. So this is actually one way a uh, plant's um, um, uh, sexual feature, but there's also other ways. Um, there's also plants that have like both male and female flowers on the same plants, but in divided organs. And somehow it always reminds me a bit this uh, myth, mythos of Aristophanes, who say that um, before we were like all clothed by the back, male, female, but also male, male, female, female. And then that something terrible happened and we got uh, cut in half. And uh, somehow some plants um, still have like these both features on their, on their own uh, yeah, body. And uh, those plants are called uh, monoecious, so it means they have both male and female characteristics in the same plants. And this is, if we take, for instance, the example of the spruce, which is like a big uh, conifer tree who grows in high altitude, we see that it has uh, two kinds of flowers. The first one here, uh, the erected one, is the main flower, so the staminate flower of the tree. When the other one uh, with uh, this beautiful boroni color is the female flower of the tree. And then when pollination occurs, um, yeah, the male flower desiccate and the female flower uh, produce these uh, seed cones, which allow the new uh, generations to happen. So here, as you, as you we can see in that case, it's uh, female, male and female organs on the same plant. Actually, those um, two modes of reproduction of uh, sexual um, features that I just showed you are quite rare. And most of the plants we know to are quite archaic, let's say. And most of the plants we know today are uh, so-called uh, hermaphroditic. It's like more than 90% of all the plants we know. And uh, an example, for instance, is this uh, hoster, so small-leaved plant and lily which has, uh, if you look at the flowers, it has like um, the, f the male part of the flower, so carrying the pollen, and the female part uh, in one organ. So that's why they are called hermaphroditic. And interestingly enough, it's also something that the, that the botanist called as a perfect flower. And then there is also, it goes, I mean, it goes more further and further and more and more. And it's what I find is uh, very uh, interesting about it. Like there's as many uh, rules as there is exceptions or the other way around. And if we look, for instance, the, the Cilinellugaris, so the bladder compion, which is like a little so-called weed you can find on the pathway, on the path along the edge of the boat. Uh, actually, the, this plant can have like uh, flowers which are hermaphroditic, but it can also have flowers which are only uh, female, that only carries the, uh, the pistillate part, and other flowers which are like uh, only male, meaning that they only carry the, the staminate part of the flower with the pollen. And then it goes, it goes further. Um, if we look at the wild carrot, for instance, so also like a spontaneous plant, you find a lot uh, on the embankments or like on, on meadows or fallowlands. Uh, what we see as being uh, one flower, the umbel, is actually like a lot of uh, small flowers. And uh, if you look a bit further at the, what's inside, the, uh, what, what the flowers are, you realize, or one can realize that it's a pattern. And then the outer, outer part of the, of the flowers is hermaphroditic, when the inner part of the umbel uh, is male. So, so somehow, I mean, this is, and can we even go further? I mean, I want to, <laughs> I, I hope it was already uh, enough in terms of botanical, uh, freshing up in botanical knowledge. Um, but there's also some plants which can uh, change, uh, transform, go from one uh, sex to the other, 
which serves as male, and then uh, go through so-called uh, sexual maternity, maturity, and become female. And, and also, yeah, many other kinds of way, I'm a politic male, female, all at the same time. And somehow I found it quite interesting because it's, it's super common, it's really everywhere. And it's uh, put into questions once we, what we think is natural somehow. Or like natural, natural or naturality is often used as a way to, uh, to say that some uh, behaviors are right and some are wrong. But actually, if we look at the natural world, uh, it's very diverse. And I think that's quite beautiful. So this actually, uh, this first more botanical research led me to get interested by the um, history of the discovery of sex, sexuality in the plant world, which is also quite, uh, quite fascinating. So it took a long time before the fact that plants uh, had sexual organs was discovered. And I believe that it was because there was always this idea of plants as being either something uh, pure or like neutral or asexual. Or if there were like some uh, links to sexuality in the natural world, it was more often thought that nature were maybe more female because flowers, they are beautiful, uh, they, they have a nice smell, you need to protect them. And those things were more like related to um, an idea of femininity. Um, actually, the first uh, scientist that uh, got an idea about uh, a hint about um, the fact that plants had uh, sexual sexuality and sexual organs was Aristoteles, and he thought that um, to understand the world around him, Aristoteles thought that you have to that he had to compare it with its with its own body, and then he thought, okay, maybe if the so this is not a drawing of Aristoteles, it's, it's my drawing, just to, um, but somehow he thought that to, um, yeah, that somehow to certainly, yeah, he thought that a plant was like a, a human body upside down, and that where the mouth was, uh, was in the earth, so where the roots were, that the twig was like the torso of the plant, and he thought that then certainly that there was sexual organs somewhere. But interestingly enough, this idea was not picked up for a long time. And uh, I think it's because culturally it was not possible to, to develop that further um, at the time. And I, I think also certainly it's because I like to compare these two pictures. So they're almost uh, contemporary from the mid 15th and early 16th century. And on the left side, you can see a, a herbal. So the first herbal were made um, for medicinal purpose, um, mostly to be able to describe the medicinal properties of plants. And they were often made uh, from copies. So it was copies and copies of uh, original works. And uh, they were quite far away from maybe the, the really depicting the plants. And here, uh, I mean, those two, so the herbal is on the left, and it and the pinks to plantain, to plantago. But somehow I find it's very difficult to, to recognize it. And on the, red, on, the, on the right side, you see the, the, the very famous uh, big piece of turf of uh, Dürer, where there you see quite clearly this, uh, this planter. So um, somehow there is always the, this nature, but uh, the way, yeah, is the way we look at it also, which is uh, as important as nature itself. So although it was not uh, acknowledged that plants, for a long time, that plants had sexual features, um, sexual reproduction wa was nevertheless used uh, in the plant world, but was not acknowledged as such. Um, one example is the, the use of sexual reproduction for agricultural purpose. So this is a fresco from the Asian time, and um, it's in an orchard of palm trees. And palm trees, they are like uh, the Asians, so they're like the you, they can be either male or female. And we think that during that, uh, on this fresco, that the Asian is like pollinating the, the, the female tree palm with the pollen of the male tree palm in order to produce it. So this was happening, but was not acknowledged as, as being sexual. Another example of uh, use of uh, sexual reproduction in plants it was for, uh, it's for horticulture. 
especially the Dutch, um, which mastered it in the golden age, in the 17th century, and uh, to produce a very different kind of, um, of sorts of tulips and bulbs in general, which uh, even um, launched um, the, the Spain city, uh, an artistic movement of the Florigeum, which was the part depicting all the um, uncanny variety of bulbs that uh, that was being able to produce. And interestingly enough, also this led to the so-called uh, tulip mania, which is was a craze for like uh, the tulip bulb. And in a couple of years, the price of uh, of an onion, like of a tulip bulb, increased uh, two hundred fold. Um, before to, to crash suddenly, and this is uh, thought as being the first, or Anonetch has been the first uh, financial uh, bubble and subsequently financial crash of the of the Eastern. Then, with time, so it became uh, more clear for botanists that uh, plants had sexuality. Also, the microscope developed, so for technology, it was possible to look a bit more into uh, the organs of the plants. And Linnaeus, the Swedish botanist, made this, uh, this classification of, the, of, the, of different flowers based on the uh, sexual organs. And which is quite interesting <coughs> with that is that um, actually, it, like the more uh, male organs are the plants, so, because usually there is one like uh, pistillate, so one female organ, and the male uh, organ carrying the pollen, they can be, they can be lots. And according to Linarius, according to his classification, the the more a plant had uh, staminate, so the more a plant had uh, male organs, the higher it was in the classification. So it was also somehow like uh, looking at nature with the eyes of his time. And um, I also find the drawing on the right quite amusing. It's from Guru, so this uh, English botanist, and he's de depicting the, uh, the staminate part of the flower, so the male part. And he's like uh, extremely, um, I don't know, he's, he really thickens like the filament, which carries the pollen, also give, gives it some hair. I mean, it's, it's quite a disproportionate drawing, and it was certainly uh, to show the more like, uh, Manliness somehow of the of the stamin stamin staminate flower. Okay, so finally, I mean, discussion grew, and uh, there was more and more people saying, "No, it's uh, plants have sexual organs." Still, it didn't go. Uh, it wasn't smoothness, and there was a lot of debate in the scientific world about the fact to know if it was uh, true or not. And uh, namely, uh, Goethe brought a pamphlet uh, against it because he was completely against the uh, idea that plants can have uh, sexual organs. And he called it the uh, metamorphosis of the plants. In the, I have written in the late uh, 18th century. And for him, plants, so metamorphosis is more like um, an award you give to uh, insects, like for instance, to uh, butterflies uh, that grow from the, from the cocoon to the caterpillar to the butterfly. Um, and for uh, Goethe, the plants were also uh, developing uh, from metamorphosis, so not, not sexual. So then finally, at the end of the 19th century, uh, there was a consensus uh, on the fact that uh, plants had sexuality. And I find it quite interesting because, uh, I mean, the discovery of sex in animals was um, already, it was already uh, discovered in antiquity. And then he did all those steps until the 19th century until this uh, acknowledgement was possible. And I think it's because we always somehow look at the world with the, yeah, with the eyes on our time somehow. And why is it important? Um, it's important because sex sexual reproduction in plants is important because it allows uh, DNA of plants to mix, uh, new seeds to arise, and these uh, new platelets to grow, and somehow all the diversity, all the plants that we have um, in the world, they were possible through evolution, through uh, sexual reproduction. Because, as you certainly know, there is also another way plants can reproduce. If you if you do a cutting of a plant and you put it in another uh, vase, uh, you get a new plant. But 
then the cutting and the, the parent plants um, carry the same DNA, so they are clones. And uh, sexual um, reproduction in plants is important to, um, yeah, to allow plants to develop. And it's also nowadays with also topics of climate change is quite uh, crucial. And so it also plans to evolve, but it also allows plants to co-evolve. And um, I mean, this is some pictures I took in the spring in a, in a walk I did. Um, it's the it's uh, orchids that developed their petals uh, to mimic the pollinator they want to attract, which I find is very amazing. Um, this, for instance, like the bee orchid. So this is not an insect. It's really just like the reproduction of what an insect looks like by the plant. I think it's uh, it's fascinating. And then some maybe less known varieties like the the fly orchids imitating a fly and the spider orchid imitating the, uh, the spider. So all of this was only possible through uh, sexual reproduction. So what can we learn from that? Um, so uh, yeah, for me as a landscape architect, so I work with plants, but I also work with uh, public space. And uh, somehow I, I went a bit through the same process. Like there was always uh, to think, okay, there is, I realized, okay, there's this idea of nature, and uh, we always thought that nature was something neutral, but then when you start to scratch a bit and see a bit uh, what's behind this idea, there's so much more. And I um, wanted to do the same thing with, for public space, because I was, or oh, it took me a long time, or I always thought the city was maybe something neutral or something uh, inclusive for everybody. And then when I start to scratch a bit, I realized that it's not really the case. And I like this uh, picture of Gordon Mata Clark. It's he's, like splitting the like um, um, yeah this uh, house, which is a bit the symbol of the heterosexual family, uh, with uh, one daughter, one son, and one dog. And then just to to see and pierce and see what's behind it. And uh, I like very much the the sentence of uh, the American architect and educator Leslie Kent Eisman who tells us that uh, the built environment is largely the creation of white masculine subjectivity. It's neither value-free value nor inclusively human. And I started to think a bit about it and try to understand it, and went through some topics also about public space. So this is a, a work I did uh, in the suburb in person, where we are like um, looking amongst other this uh, statue of uh, Mr. Wettstein, which uh, is a Swiss politician who also gave the, his, his name to the bridge nearby. And uh, so there's a question of representativity of statues that often really like show male uh, characters. Or if it's female ones, they are like often you know, naked somehow. Um, but then there's also the question of the statue, but also of the street names. I mean, there's a lot of uh, street names which are named uh, rather through like uh, male heterosexual white people. And there is also some group of activists uh, that try legally or illegally to uh, change that. I find my people so quite interesting because, so this is a map of, of the streets of Paris and in blue are like uh, all the streets named after like uh, male and in uh, red are the streets named since after women. So I feel the disbalance is quite clear. Um, but also, there is also some positive example. And uh, for instance, there is a small city uh, in the center of France called uh, La Ville aux Dames, close to Tours. And this city was originally a, a female monastery and kept the tradition to have uh, only uh, street names named after women. So the whole city has only uh, female street names. So it is possible as well. Um, then something else I realized also, so this is a, a map of, again, of Basel, and there you can see all the kind of activities that are available. And a lot of them are really more um, soccer, te tennis table, uh, skate park. And somehow when we start to look at the figures, we see that um, all those activ sport activities are mostly uh, so male dominated. So for instance, soccer, like 11% uh, of the users are, uh, are women. I mean, maybe it's changing a bit now. Basketball, it's uh, a fourth, and tennis table also a fourth. And 
somehow this simple way that can be somehow um, monitored or changed. Um, for instance, in, if instead of having a skate, a skate park, because skate park requires dangerous, it requires a lot of str uh, strength. But for instance, if you have a skating rink, um, so that maybe becomes way more inclusive. Um, or also, I don't know why, but the statistics also say that um, female users uh, favor uh, activities like badminton or volleyball. I'm not sure why. Um, and I also, I also like that more girls uh, use uh, skate parks. But I think it's also, I mean, as a landscape architect, it's also, uh, and, and um, decision makers for the, especially decision makers for the city, it's also a role to propose a, a wider offer. And the last um, point I would like to address is about trees, because at the end, the <laughs> main topic <laughs> of today. Uh, and there also there is uh, really enough some uh, discrimination, and um, because and it's uh, I think it has all to do with reproduction somehow, and uh, because female trees are, are like trees that are productive are being seen uh, so producing fruits, for instance are seen as being dirty and not accepted in the city. Like this ginkgo is a good example because the ginkgo is like the um, pine tree, it's also like the yo, it's uh, the oasis. So it can only be male or only female. And the female tree, so it's a very old tree, and the female tree, they, uh, they produce fruits, or the flowers, sorry, which are pollinated by insects. And um, to attract insects, they have a quite acrid um, smell, which I, which I, I think is a reason so I'm not that bad. But uh, so usually they are like, it's only male uh, ginkgo trees which are planted in a public space. But I think it, it goes also way beyond that. It's really about so all those fruit trees or productive trees which are seen as um, not being uh, accepted or not being uh, appropriate, let's say, for the city. And there's also, uh, also nevertheless, some good examples. And if we look at uh, Sevilla in the south of Spain, there are many trees are bordered with, um, with orange trees, which is amazing. And um, also for the little story, actually, these oranges are quite uh, are like sour oranges. And uh, the Spanish don't like that so much. But then when the trees are being harvested, they are like shipped to the UK. And it's why I like the um, marmalade is made that uh, I heard you you like. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is um, my nice slides, uh, and I would like to finish with this picture because I find it extremely uh, fascinating. Uh, so it's Cupid, and it is inspiring plants with love in a tropical landscape. And I hope that in return, we can also get inspired by nature to create a more uh, inclusive society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia. That was, that was great. So we have two more speakers that I want to ask to join me on the stage now. There's, um, there's Imogen Clark, who will be speaking first, and then there's Carol Wright as well. I can introduce them both now, maybe, while they're, while they're hopefully coming and joining me. Um, so Imogen is, oh, let me find my notes. She's a lawyer and a feminist and a co-founder of a charity uh, called Make Space for Girls and the chair and trustee of Age UK London. And I came across um, her in the, through a project that we're working on at East and her clarity of uh, thought and vision was sort of really impressive. Um, all their work is sort of based on the Equality Act of 2010 and is trying and it's sort of trying to gather evidence of how parks are being used. So it's very much sort of going along with sort of what Celine ended ended on. And in the background, you'll see so we have some slides running through. So you see some quotes that um, that uh, the, the Make Space for Girls charity got from research they did and co-design with, um, with sort of young, young people and I'll introduce Carol after. Lovely, well, be keeping to time as well. Do you yeah, do you? Good. Does this work? Hi. Yeah, okay, that's fantastic. So Make Space for Girls are a really small charity and we are campaigning and generally making a bunch of we can to try and make our parks and green spaces 
as welcoming to teenage girls as they can be. Because one of the things that sort of struck me during the pandemic, going around parks, weren't they wonderful? They were just a refuge. And when children started being able to play in the parks again, that was wonderful. And we saw the little kids on the play park and you walk past the skate parks and the Moogers and the BMX tracks and there were young people there having a great time and you thought, yes, this is what parks are about. This is why they are so wonderful. And then I suddenly saw, but where are the teenage girls? On the multi-use games areas, on those fence pitches, why are there no teenage girls playing basketballs? Why are there no teenage girls coming and kick around? On the skate park, surely, you know, girls skate. I know girls skate. Why aren't they on the skate park? So I thought maybe this is me being delusional. I can't, I can't see them, they're there. Maybe it's just my park or the parks I happen to go to. Maybe there are other parks that are full of teenage girls all having a great time on teen facilities. But that isn't the case. I was talking to some young women, year nine to year 12 in Cambridge. And I said, okay, skate parks, BMX tracks, fence pitches. How many in this room think they're used mostly by girls? Not a hand went up. I said, how many in this room think they're used kind of 50-50 boys and girls? Not a hand went up. I said, okay, how many of you think these teenage spaces are used mostly by boys and young men? Every hand in the room went up. These were teenage girls. They knew something that planners and designers and architects and everybody had completely not spotted that these spaces that we say are for teenagers are actually not being used by teenage girls. And then you get somebody who comes back to you on X and they say, it's just that the girls choose not to use these spaces. These spaces are perfectly available to them, but they're choosing not to use them. They're choosing not to go in the parks. Are they? Are they really? Not when you talk to them. When you talk to teenage girls and young women, they tell you, they tell you, there isn't really a place for us. There's a quote that's running around where one of the girls said, yeah, I used to hang around the skate park when I was younger, but I don't do it now. That there isn't a space for us. And teenage girls and young women tell us how they feel judged in public space and how that sense of judgment is so much more acute than the young men feel. And it's all to do with culture and expectations and stereotyping. But they feel that they have no reason to be in a space. If there's nothing for them in the park, why are they even there? There's not a good reason for them to be in the park. Well, they're probably only there for a bad reason, aren't they? And you can attach whatever bad reason you want to. But if there's no good reason for them to be there, people will infer that they're there for a bad reason. And that's not fair. So I think we're trying to encourage people to see this discrimination that's been hiding in plain sight. I never noticed it, you know, to my shame. I had a teenage daughter. Never occurred to me, why did she enjoy hanging around with her mates on buses? I mean, it was an odd thing to do when I look back. Answer, because for children in London, the zip card is wonderful. It has to be protected for Emma, but that's another rant. They could travel around on buses. It was safe. It was warm. It was somewhere where they didn't feel they didn't belong. And young women are supposed to be on buses, aren't they? So no one's gonna judge a young woman for being on a bus. The young woman's not supposed to be in a park, so I'll be judged there. Now, I didn't spot any of this. But once I did spot it, I started to think, let's just try and change it. Well, that's really what I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. And we some of the ideas that we ask each other a few questions that you can ask questions um, after as well. But I wanted to introduce Carol first. Um, so she's an artist, an urban activist, a community gardener, and she does a huge range of things. She she runs two community gardens. She's working with the Tate and Peabody. She had a residency at the White House in Dagenham. And I've invited her today also because she founded an organization called Black Cloud Side that was campaigning um, for equal access to green spaces. And that's um, what I started to talk about in the context of this idea of trespassing and claiming space. Uh, so Karen, okay. here you go. Hi. Can you hear me okay? So first and foremost, I have to say I'm from Lambert. This is very important as we are in Lambert. Mm -hmm. And we're here at the Garden Museum and I live and uh, work 
supporting the two community gardens, which will come up on the screen at some stage. Um, so I say, and, and I'm agreeing with you about the spaces that, that are called for young women, and, but also the lack of, and I have to say this first, access to spaces like this for people who look like me and who are for Lambeth, black working class women. I'm, I'm, yes, we see that there have been exhibitions here called Sewing Roots, which I was involved in, but it's very important to say that because of the projects I'm going to talk about, because it has significance. Because really, as a kid, working class kid from the housing estate, not too far from here, I shouldn't be sitting here on a panel about to talk about supporting people to access green spaces, to support people to feel safe. As a child, um, I didn't, I felt safe because I was with my friends running up and down because I'm of a generation where I could jump on the bus and go to green spaces and do art because it was funded, because the Greater London Council was around in the London Education Authority would fund trips to places like here before the big redesign has happened. So I've had access to an education which then my niece's generation did not, my nieces and nephews do not. And why I say that is because there were some banners here, if you look in the middle there, to support indigenous people made with and paid for by Kate Modern. So that's my role, is to support primary schools, housing estate residents who don't have a voice and have access to institutions and places like here. So I have brought children who go to Friars Primary School to come here to access the resources. And they're not because they are in Southwark, they're not on the immediate doorstep of this um, institution. So they are easily overlooked. So the louder the voice and the, the, the income bracket of the pyramids, you will have access to these spaces. So what happens is you then like myself, how long life, long housing estate dweller, you think, well, how could we do band together with other people to get things done? One of those things was to set up a community garden on my estate, um, 10 years old, so that's Peabody Blackfriars. Prior to that, working as a community gardener, no experience of setting up community gardens or anything, but having volunteered, being asked to support via Tate Modern and the organisation I was working with. The creation of a community garden 16 years ago, Brixton, Brookwood Triangle, on a housing estate, on a horrible piece of grass, which was a dog toilet. So the artist was commissioned, as is common. Um, could you design, as your commission for Tate Modern, a garden on that housing estate? You didn't need the consent of the residents because the local authority already said, yes, OK, if they make noise, it's too bad. They're going to have a community garden in six weeks' time on that estate, whether they want it or not. Lucky for those residents, or unlucky, <laughs> I'm a nice one housing estate dweller. There you go. So I kept it real with the residents. I said, you know what, going round door knocking, with a clipboard, with a set of questions, do you want a community garden on that triangle of land? And I, hmm, well, it's better than a dog toilet. Fair enough. 99.9% .9 of people supported it. Because in that asking of the residents, I would just say, well, you see, I live on a neighbouring estate. I've lived on estates all my life. It's going to be there whether you like it or not. So I went off script there. 16 years later, the garden is being redesigned by the residents themselves. So there's an orchard on there, children's play facilities will come in on there. So that was garden number one. Then on a tenant managed estate, Bermondsey, employed by Groundwork, we set up another garden. And the residents, very important co-design and hearing my fellow panelists, co-design is crucial to these spaces. How much time do you have to get involved? 
what practical skills or otherwise do you have because not everything is about putting your hand in the soil. Then the third garden in SE1, all of these gardens I mentioned are in Southwark. We designed that garden. We designed that garden with Peabody, had tremendous support from the neighbourhood manager. We were lucky. It happened at the time before many mergers have taken Peabody away from community engagement projects because I think they're on merger number five. That garden is 10 years old and it's been redesigned as in Brookwood. And speaking of Peabody Blackfriars Estate, when COVID lockdown happened, what um, I and number of estate elders were made aware of by the youth, predominantly the young men, but also the women and, and girls, was that there was, became a very heavy police presence, not just on that estate, but estates um, very close to the House of Parliament. So having been stopped myself by undercover police, I'm using the good words today, because uh, <laughs> normally it's Babylon, you see, there it had to come out, I am in Lambeth, and I lived through the uprisings. So have you been stopped by undercover police and asked to speak to the children because they were hanging around the multi-use playing areas? So my question was, first, who were they? They had to ID themselves. Why should I be asked to stop the ch children and youth playing? Because you look like you work for the housing association and they seem to know you and mentioned gardening with you. Our response, because I... I went through the uprisings in Brixton and how that did not happen on that scale ever again to the young people because of this militarisation. We decided to have a festival, create Black Outside, a loose collective of people, have a plant sale right here, have a plant sale in the community garden at Blackfriars, and the money went to queer, black, low income charities. So that's how Black Outside came about, and Black Outside now manages the two gardens. So I think the way we can do this is that I'll ask a question first, and then Sivine answers, and maybe asks the next question. Should we try? Should we try that? So. One thing, I'm mean, maybe touching a little bit on what um, Carol also saying is, I thought that was a really interesting presentation. That's sort of in the same way that there's sort of debate about um, gender and the right sort of the right type of tree. There's also with sort of landscape architecture, lots of discussion and ecology about um, the importance of native plants and how they have evolved more to be beneficial to our wildlife. And that's obviously a highly problematic term. And I wanted to know what Celine thought about that, maybe to start off. Yeah, it's also a very uh, cultural uh, topic somehow because, uh, I mean, where I work, uh, we get from the city those lists of plants which are like native, which are, we, that we are like more, more than encouraged to use. Um, the question is, it's always relative somehow because uh, the plants that are declared uh, as native are the ones which were there. So um, there's a specific date which is like a uh, when Christopher Colomb uh, this, uh, um, entered America, uh, all the plants that, uh, and then after that, there was a huge um, movement of plants that were like brought back to, to Europe. And so the plants that arrived after that time are considered as being uh, um, exotic. And some of them are potentially invasive. But it's a very, I mean, if you look at the scale of uh, evolution of plants, it's a very tiny, it's only the last 300 years. And the plants before that, which arrived um, be before, before the, the 18th century, they're considered as being assimilated. And an example is, for instance, like the, the apple tree. Apples actually came from the, yeah, the Silk Road to Europe in the, in the 14th century. So it's always very relative somehow. What, what do you refer to? And it's, it's also not so easy because it's also not that uh, there is some, um, some uh, exotic plants which are like quite invasive and that are really, because plants, they, they work in community somehow. And there's some plants, uh, I mean, the Japanese lot with, it's a very infamous example. And so some of these plants, they, 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 they take the whole space in the ecosystem. So, 
it's very, it's not so easy, it's not black and white, we need to be a bit careful um, with those topics. But I believe most of the exotic plants are harmless somehow, and it's always really about, I promise a question of uh, cultural identity. I think it's similar than with the, um, uh, with, with the sexuality of plants. It's, it's, it's easy because they don't speak and then you can just uh, put any idea or concept onto them. And so it's uh, yeah, a bit of, uh, of uh, <laughs> difficult to, but it's very, poli it's mostly political. Thank you. And do, do you want to ask anybody a question? Do you, or not sure that I can ask? Um, yeah, maybe Morgan, I can ask you. <laughs> Um, because you see that uh, your charity is about uh, making space for girls, and maybe could you do you did you find out or how would be like an ideal space for public space for young girls? Uh, how how should that look like? Is it something you can a bit tell us about? I mean, what's kind of sad is that we don't really know because no one's trying to make one. And we had this really interesting example of a group of young people who were co-designing. And they'd been asked to co-design a teenage space. So they did an outdoor gym and they did a basketball court. And they're both really nice and they're both really good pieces of co-design. And they talked to some local young women and they said, oh, that's a nice bit of co-design. Mm, lovely. They said, would you use it? And they went, no. I said, what's going on? Something's gone wrong. And I said, maybe the boys at the group were really dominant and the girls didn't get a chance to say their ideas. No, no, no. When they went back to the co-design group, they said, well, you, you designed this teenage space, but the teenage girls say they don't want to use it. What's, what's happened here? And the girls in the co-design group said, you asked us to design a teenage space. That is what a teenage space looks like. It is not <coughs> your gym. It's a basketball court. And if we might say so, it's a very nice, well-designed co-design place. It's what you asked for and we gave it to you. And the question was just wrong. They should have said to the group, design a space you would use. And if you ask the wrong question, you'll get the wrong answer. And nobody has really done that with young people here in the UK. No one's really sat down and said, design a space that's for you. And that's what we need to do. Thank you, thank you. Do you have a question to somebody else? Um, go it, yeah. Could I ask Carol, I suppose, um, when you're thinking about the role that young people can play uh, and within community gardening, how do you how do you excite them about those roles? A good question. Uh, because there's that long history, myself and other estate elders have with them we gather where they gather. So they like gather around the outside of the basketball court. So we go and stand up there and just look like we're going to bother them. So they know that something <laughs> is about to happen. And it's like, we have a walk around and a chat or they will call a meeting. So there's a WhatsApp group that they set up. They call a meeting or we have to go and sit in Starbucks. So it's, it's a case of them leading the way on these things where then it's all, it's the same as the garden spaces, which I'm just a guardian of. I'm just somebody, the whole space. And yes, I have a set of skills and I know many people who are coming, who are residents, so we share those skills. So we're like, if we are, if there's changes to be made, what changes would you like to see? So there's, there's ways that could, you could show photos on phone or whatever, of spaces nearby because there's nothing like let's have better things than the neighbouring estate competition people like when we had the table tennis table delivered where you're like please do not let one single neighbourhood manager beat us at anything other people from other estates so we have a walk we're like well what have you got there and why have you got it so it's conversation that go on because you, you know so that's that's how we cite them and DJ sex Tunage, very important. Um, so you've got to have a bit of decent food. Don't be telling people about sandwiches because <laughs> not going to happen. Got to be Caribbean, Turkish, you know, Ethiopian, Nepalese food. Proper food um, that they want to eat and cut because they're black outside water. We're going to have some 
fire food when we let it to Peabody they had biscuits and <laughs> nobody's going to answer any question if you give them biscuits or water uh, you know not going to happen so we let them be and it's, it's supported people so when we did the um, event here hello Richard I see you over there um, we were like so what's important to you and as we're talking tree talk it was the trees funny enough it's because they live one set of the what the, the um, youngsters live on a housing estate where the caveat value of the trees is six million pounds great great to this estate the trees are 160 years old so they've grown up with that nature they understand biodiversity in an urban environment so they have a high level of involvement there used to be and it's coming back gardening clubs in schools so there's this level of engagement from that age and it really does need to start from when they're young it needs to start and unfortunately so that's um, a um, the black outside logo based on conversations with the young people you see that they're helping with the garden um, and favorite objects that they chose from the garden like the webby boots the hand tools the red watery cans the people from um, different cultural backgrounds so they already have trust. I think the biggest thing is trust because they know we're coming from the same place. So when we've got degrees, you've got people from different social economic backgrounds on that estate, social housing estate. So you've got people who have got drug and mental health support needs. You've got people who manage family contact centres, people who work as university lecturers. But what you do when, when you approach young people, it's like, you have the same voice and input as anybody else who lives in one of these 20 blocks of flats. Very, very important to listen. We don't come and come top down. We're like, what do you want? Yeah, what do you want? And that's what we did when the police started to come and we got the local councillors involved. Because they know, because they collude with the police. They can try and take me to court for libel, but they know it's true. Um, <laughs> and it was like, we got money for the first time in a decade. <coughs> what they wanted as a play equipment, badminton, table tennis, decent basketballs. Could you please repair the, the broken basketball hoop that'd been broken for three years? Do they have to go shoot at one end of the, the, the Mooga? Things like that, but it's not easy. And it depends what's going on as well, because country life is a very real thing where these young children are recruited from these estates and neighbouring areas to sell drugs outside of London. This is a very, very real thing in these parts around here. And we don't ignore it. We know the naughty boys and girls. But trust and believe, the best risk assessment I have ever seen done at any time was by young people who trained as security guards. I don't see anything like it. They put all the neighbourhood managers, ourselves, to shame. They said, this is how people get entered enter, this is how they're going to exit, the flower park thing's going to be fantastic, we're going to put the gazebo up here, we're, people aren't going to go mad eating, eating good food, <laughs> we'll, we'll portion it out. But trust, asking, listening, what do you want? Make their bleed on it. It's a longer process, but you know, I'm not going to be bop where I am, but they, they know that. We, we, we all bop on the equipment as well. But if he's there for them. So if they have some involvement, why should they bother? And that thing of the young women and girls using the equipment is still important till this day. Because we see that the playground part of the estate with the swings is where the young women feel the safest. And the boys and young men tend to congregate around the basketball. Yeah. So sorry, that's a bit long. <laughs> Great, thank you.